open your Bibles with us this morning. Uh, We're going to be reading from God's Word and specifically from John uh, chapter 18. And we're going to start reading at verse 28. So John chapter 18, verse 28 is where we're going to get started this morning. Then the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial ceremonial uncleanliness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. This happened so that the words Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you are right in saying, I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. With this, he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in a rebellion. Continuing in chapter 19. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him in the face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace, Where do you come from? he asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realise I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jews kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was a day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king. Pilate said to the Jews, but they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. 
and continuing our reading from verse 16b. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write, the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, They divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing all that was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hip hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This is God's word. Good morning. I suspect that uh, having got over our technical difficulties, it's all coming through clearly now. I want to just thank those who are here this morning. Uh, we are grateful to Scott Morrison, our Prime Minister, for giving us permission to be here this morning, but I also want to thank those who have come here this morning, our musicians, uh, whom you all know if you come to Castle Hill, the Bible readers, uh, and those also doing the technical side of it this morning. I really appreciate the fact that they've come out and we've been able to do this, and I trust that you are benefiting from it. I want to read uh, from 1 John chapter 1. This is, in a sense, the second part of John writing. We have John read to us earlier by the Bible readers, and now I want to turn to his next letter as he writes to the churches. And I want to read from 1 John 1 verse 8, and we're going to pick it up uh, at two verse, uh, chapter 2 verse 2, and we'll focus on some of those verses. 1 John 1 uh, verse 8. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the world. We're going to look at that passage in a little bit more detail. Let's pray and ask for God's help this morning. Lord Jesus, we are deeply conscious that today is a remembrance service at one level, 
remembering what you have done, but it is also a celebration. For it is through your suffering that we are set free, that we can have life, that we can know with absolute certainty that our sins are forgiven. We can't even begin to imagine what you must have suffered on that cross, but you suffered for us. And so this morning, as we remember your death, as we remember your sacrifice, as we remember your work, there is a sense in which we are both sad and glad. Sad that you had to suffer so terribly. Glad that we have benefited from your suffering. And as we turn to your word, we ask for insight, understanding, open our eyes that we might see Jesus. For his sake we pray. Amen. If our greatest need had been information, God would have sent an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist or maybe a computer technician. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. And so God sent us a savior. Jesus comes into this world not to satisfy our needs, not to make us happy, although there is joy in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, a joy that is beyond the happiness that the world has to offer. Jesus did not come into this world to make us feel good about ourselves. He did not come into this world so that we can not experience any pain or suffering or be healed from all of our diseases, though he is the great healer. Jesus comes into this world because we have a problem. And the problem that you and I experience is that we have been cut off from God. We have been estranged from God. Our sinfulness, our nature has caused us to be enemies of God. We are told in Romans chapter 5 that once we were enemies of God. And that John tells us in John chapter 3 verse 36 that God's wrath is upon us. And we know that it's because of our being cut off from God, estranged from God, that Jesus comes into this world in order that we might be reconciled back to God, in order that we might find life, in order that we might have the burden of our sins lifted, forgiven, taken away from us, in order that we might be cleansed, in order that we might find life in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus must come into this world because if Jesus doesn't come into this world, then you and I are doomed forever. And if he doesn't come and suffer and die on our behalf, then there is no hope for us. Then everything we do is going to end in disaster and is going to end in shame and is going to end in our destruction. But it is precisely because Jesus looks down upon this world and sees a humanity that is lost, that has fallen, that is in darkness, that he comes into this world in order to die on that cross so that you and I might find life in him, might be reconciled to God, might come into relationship with him. And were it not for Jesus coming to this world, you and I could not be here this morning watching on this TV without having any kind of hope. It is the hope that he provides for us through his death, through his resurrection, that enables us to be able to celebrate today amidst the sense of grief that we have that Jesus had to suffer as such. Jesus is God's answer to our sin. Jesus is the solution to our being estranged from God. And John picks up on these themes as he writes to these churches scattered throughout. Firstly, I want you to notice he reveals to us the truth about 
our sin or the truth about man's sin. Look at verses 8 and verse 10. I'll read them quickly. If we claim to have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar. Or, verse 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We need to understand that our sin problem is a universal problem. It's not something that just a section of the population struggle with. But all of us have been infected with a disease called sin. And sin for us, if we understand it aright, at its essence, is our rebellion against God. We have offended a holy God, a God who has created us to enjoy fellowship with him. And we have broken that fellowship because we have turned our back against God and we have chosen to follow our own paths. And the reason we have done that is because we are born with a sinful nature. And that sinful nature predisposes us towards sin. You and I can't help it. We're born that way. We are born as sinners. And so our every disposition, our every inclination is to follow what we are by nature. And so we can't help the fact that we rebel against God. It is part of who we are. So we are not only sinners because we are born within a nature that is bound in sin, but we are also sinners because then we follow through with that nature and we commit acts that are in rebellion against what God has revealed and in rebellion to God's holy, perfect nature. And because of that rebellion against God, all of us are infected with this disease called sin. Now, when our two boys were much younger, and we're going back a number of years now, when they were uh, uh, still, uh, before they turned uh, nine and ten in their early years, I remember once having to uh, sort out a dispute that they were having. Michael, our eldest, had provoked our youngest Stephen and as a result of provoking him by saying something or doing something to him our youngest boy Stephen had lashed out and punched him and I had to grab Stephen and Michael together and I had to find out what had happened so that I could tell Michael that he was not to provoke his brother like that in future and then I had to deal with Stephen and tell him that when he is provoked the right response is not to punch his brother. Now, Janice and I, when they were young, did not sit down with them, and we did not say to them, Michael, we want you to do whatever you need to do to provoke your brother so that he gets angry. And we did not sit down with Stephen and say to Stephen, when you are provoked, Stephen, this is the way you deal with it. You clench your fist, and you go and you punch Michael as hard as you can, and that way he won't provoke you again. We didn't teach them that. We taught them not to do that. But because they are born as sinners and they have a sinful nature, that's what came to the surface when they were under pressure. That's what they did because it was consistent with who they are according to their sinful nature. And all of us suffer in that way. That's why in Psalm 51 verse 5, David writes and he says, Surely... I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Do you hear that? David understands that at the moment of conception, before he has been born into this world, he already has a problem. Already he is a sinner. And for those of you who know your Bible, you will know That Psalm 51 deals with David's confession after he has committed adultery and murder. He has committed adultery with another man's wife. And then he has summoned that man uh, when they were out in battle home to try and get him to sleep with his wife so that he can cover up the fact that she's pregnant from the adulterous relationship that he's entered into. And when this man doesn't sleep with his wife, He sends him back to the battle lines and he says to the commander, he sends him with a note, he gives the note to the commander and on the note the commander said, put this man on the front lines. 
because David knows the chances of him being killed on the front lines are great, and that's exactly what happens. And then the prophet Nathan comes to him, and he exposes David's sin. And David comes with this confession, and he begins to talk to God about this sin. And he recognizes that he has acted according to what his nature is. But then as he goes through the psalm, he gets to the point where he understands that even though he's sinned against a whole lot of different people, ultimately he has sinned against God. And so he says, against you and you only have I sinned. His act of adultery is not only a sin against Bathsheba's husband, but it is also a sin primarily against God. And thus all of us, whenever we rebel against God, whenever we break God's ethical commands, we are sinning against God. And we are showing what we are by nature. And so there is no person in this world, including myself, that can ever claim to be free from contamination from sin. And thus, because all of us suffer from the same universal problem, all of us need forgiveness. All of us need to be rescued from our condition. All of us need to be saved from this condition of sin. And the problem is that you and I can't do anything about it. There's nothing we can do because of that contamination that could ever make us acceptable to God. Which is why do you see that John says Jesus comes along as the one who is perfectly righteous and thus becomes our advocate. He is the one who comes before God and advocates on our behalf because he is rightly qualified to advocate on our behalf. In other words, because of his perfect life, because of his righteous life, because of meeting all of God's ethical demands, because of never ever violating God's holy nature, God's perfect sinless nature, he is able to advocate on our behalf before God and stand in our place and bring our sin to God as the one who alone is sufficient to forgive us of our sins. And thus, John speaks about the fact that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And the reason he is faithful and the reason he is just is precisely because he has met the standards of God. And thus, when we confess our sin, he is faithful to forgive us our sins and he is just just in his forgiveness, because he has met the standard that God has required for justice to be executed against all those who violate God's holiness, all those who rebel against God. And thus Jesus becomes our substitute. He becomes the one who dies in our place so that we might be freed from our sin. And John picks up on this, does he not? Because he says that Jesus Christ is our atoning sacrifice, not only for our sins, but for the sins of the world, verse 2. So that secondly, Jesus' person is sufficient to take away our sins. He is absolutely sufficient to take away our sins. And he is sufficient because he has become for us our atoning sacrifice. Now I want to explain that little word in the original because it's a very, very important word. It is the Greek word halasmos for those of you who may be interested in Greek. And that little word conveys two important ideas. In the older versions of the Bible, the King James Version, for example, it was translated propitiation. And propitiation perhaps captures a little bit more the idea of what that word means, although in the NIV, atoning sacrifice is a pretty accurate description of what that means. But there are two sides to that atoning sacrifice that Jesus Christ makes for us. The one side is 
is that God must be propitiated or God's wrath must be satisfied. Because God is holy and because God is sinless, God and sin cannot coexist. It is like trying to mix oil and water. They don't mix. They are two separate entities. God and sin both can't exist simultaneously. Therefore, God must exercise his wrath against sin. His holy wrath is exercised against sin. And if that wrath is going to be satisfied, then someone needs to stand in the gap. Someone needs to stand in place. Someone needs to be able to stand as one who is able to take away our sin as an atoning sacrifice so that God's wrath may be satisfied. And thus Jesus is sent into the world as the perfect one who is born in perfection, who lives a perfect life, who wins the right to go and appear before God, to be strung up on a cross, to take upon himself the sin of the world and become our substitute, our atoning sacrifice who takes upon himself our sin and bears our sin upon himself. You know, when we think about the cross, so often we think about the physical pain and suffering that the Lord Jesus experienced on that cross. And one never wants to minimize the pain that he experienced. Not only did he have the scourging beforehand, not only was his flesh torn to pieces through those whips that were exercised against him, but then when he is strung up on the cross and he struggles to breathe, trying to push down on his legs to go up to exhale and to inhale, that suffering and agony we understand as we, we can picture him on that cross, though I'm sure we don't understand it to its full extent. But the agony of Christ is not the physical suffering. It is the spiritual suffering that he experiences. And what I mean by that is that when he takes upon himself the sin of the world, when he experiences your shame, my shame, when he experiences every wrong thought I've ever thought, every wrong action I've ever done, every sinful action I've done towards others, every harm that I've done, every evil thought that I've done, every lustful thought that I have, every time I've lied, every time I've stolen something, every time I've said something bad, every juicy piece of gossip from my mouth. Every time I have envied someone else, when I've been caught up in materialism, when I've used words that have hurt other people and caused them to go through great distress, all of that from every person who trusts in Christ, he bears himself. And as he takes upon that sin in that world, in that moment as he is on that cross, the Father, who has been in perfect fellowship with God, uh, Jesus, who has had perfect relationship with him, who has experienced perfect joy, turns his face away. And so Jesus utters that agonizing cry on that cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment of pain and agony, that fellowship, that unbroken fellowship that Jesus and God have experienced in perfection for all eternity, in that moment is broken because God cannot look upon his son while he is bearing upon himself the sin of the world and simultaneously as he turns his face away, symbolizing that presence has been broken. He executes, he directs the full measure of his holy wrath against Jesus on that cross. And that suffering is the pain of the cross. And that suffering is what Jesus Christ endures. 
for me and for all who trust in him. It's that agony that we remember this morning because only a perfect man can atone for the sins of the world. And in that moment, the sin is placed upon him and God's wrath is exercised against him. Satisfaction for our sins is made. And God's wrath is satisfied. And thus you have the two sides. The one who sacrifices himself for our sins. And God the Father whose wrath is now satisfied with the sacrifice of Christ. What that means is that now that those who come to Christ and those who, as John says, and we're going to look at that, those who confess their sin and those who turn away from their sin and those who repent of their sin won't have, when they die, the eternal wrath of God exercised against them and neither will they experience the presence of God being withdrawn from them forever. But it is dependent upon people's confession. And so John makes that clear. If you are going to experience forgiveness, if you are going to experience the weight of your sin being lifted, then it requires that you must confess your sin before God. And so he says that if we confess our sin, what does confession look like? What does it mean in this context? It means that you and I agree with the judgment of God upon our sin. We don't argue with God. We don't minimize our sin. We don't tell him it's not that serious. We don't think that somehow we can justify ourselves. Somehow we can excuse our sin. Somehow we can find an apology for why we've done what we've done. We don't argue with God about our sin. We accept the verdict that God has pronounced upon us. And God's verdict is that every single human being without exception is guilty. Guilty of transgressing his law. Guilty of violating his holiness. Guilty of rebelling against him. We agree with God. We say, yes, God, you're right. Your judgment is right. We deserve death. We deserve your wrath. We deserve being cut off from your presence. We have no excuse. We come to you with nothing in our hands. And we confess our rebellion against you. And we pledge ourselves to you. And we want to turn away from that rebellion. And we want to turn towards you. And that confession that we make must be a confession that arises out of a heart that has been broken from its sin. John makes that clear, doesn't he? Because he says to us that it's no good confessing your sin and then thinking that you can carry on sinning now that you've confessed it without worrying about the sins that you will now commit. No, John says that if you're going to repent, if you're going to turn away from your sin, there must be a genuineness to your confession. It's not just a superficial confession that says, well, I've done my, my confession now, my sins have gone, now I can just live any way I want and I can do whatever I want and I, and I can carry on living the way that I have because I've confessed it's all sorted out. No, there is a genuine wanting to turn away and live in a different way. There must be change in your life. And so we strive with the strength of God no longer to, to live the way that we used to live. That's the proof of true confession. That's the proof of true repentance. It doesn't mean that we're not going to sin again because John makes that clear. He says that we are going to continue to sin. But sin must not characterize us. It's not that we deliberately go out to sin, but when we are caught in temptation due to the weakness of our nature, sometimes we are still going to sin. And John says to us, even when you sin in that, those circumstances, there is an advocate who pleads on your behalf. There is one who will forgive you, and God's forgiveness is so generous. It is without measure. And so there is always forgiveness. When we humble ourselves before God. 
when our confession is a true confession, and when we seek with God's help to turn away from our sin, the truth is that there are some sins that are very hard to get rid of. The author to the Hebrews talks about the repetitive or the sin that, that entangles us, that's hard to get rid of. But those who have truly confessed their sin are constantly working with the help of God to sort those things out. To work on those repetitive sins. It is the sign, the proof of true repentance, true confession of sin. And then Jesus says, forgiveness is assured. God is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Forgiveness is complete because the work of Christ on the cross is finished. And absolutely complete. And therefore, when we bring our sins to God, when we confess our sin before him, when we turn away from that sin, and when we lay it at the foot of the cross, Jesus Christ stands up on our behalf as our substitute. And he says, I will bear your sin. I have paid the price so that you can go free so that you can have your sins lifted from you, so that you can find eternal life, that you can come to me and be reconciled to me, back in relationship with me. This is why we celebrate Good Friday, because if it was not for Jesus' sacrifice, none of us would have hope. We would all be lost. We would all be damned for all eternity to experience the full measure of God's wrath and the absence of his presence. But because of Jesus, he has enabled us to come to God and to lay all of our baggage at his feet, to put it at the foot of the cross, to leave it there. And we are told the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, all unrighteousness. And God removes the burden. And because he forgives us, because he cleanses us, he assures us that his forgiveness will enable us when we depart from this world to one day stand in eternity with absolute assurance that when God opens the books and he will open the books. And when we are accused of being sinners, Jesus Christ will step forward as our advocate and Jesus Christ will say, Ian Dean is forgiven. I died for him on the cross. He's one of mine. And what is true of Ian Dean is true of all Christians, of all people who have bowed before the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, who have cast their sin upon Jesus who have agreed with God's verdict and have received forgiveness of sins. That's the hope of Easter, that I go free and I don't do anything to deserve it. There's nothing I've done to merit it. It comes to me unmerited. It is God's gift to me. Jesus is God's gift to this world. It's not that God wants to condemn the world. But God wants to save the world. He wouldn't have sent Jesus if he wanted to condemn the world. And this is the forgiveness that Jesus Christ reaches out. Not only for our sins, says John, but for the sins of the entire world. That Jesus reaches down from heaven and he says to you, come, come, come. There is forgiveness in me. There is cleansing. There is life. There is reconciliation with God the Father. He offers it to all without exception. And Jesus' death is sufficient for all. But in order for you to experience the sufficiency of Jesus' death to forgive you of your sins, you must come, you must confess. You must bow at the foot of the cross and you must hand over the reins of your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
You know, it's a little bit like when you think about our current dilemma with this coronavirus. We're told that hopefully at some point, I don't know how long it's going to take, some say 18 months to two years, there'll be an antidote. There'll be a, a vaccination that we can go through that will protect us from this. Yet in order to be protected from it, you, have to, you will have to have the vaccination. It's no good saying, I'm okay, there is a vaccination that is sufficient to protect me. But if you don't have the vaccination, then you will not be protected. It's the same with the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is sufficient for every single person without distinction. But it is only effective for those who bow at the foot of the cross. Will you bow at the foot of the cross? Will you come to Jesus? Will you find life this Easter? Will this Easter be your birthday of spiritual birth? Amen. Our Father, we thank you for sending the Lord Jesus Christ, that wonderful Savior who died for us, who gave his life that we might be free from sin. O oh Lord. You know every single person who is watching this this morning. You know those who know you, who have been forgiven, who have this assurance. But you also know those who are not. You also know those who have yet to come to you, who have yet to bow their knee. Oh God, have mercy on them, I pray. Open their eyes. Let them see Jesus. Let them see his suffering, his pain. Let them see he has died so that they may be set free from the burden of sin. Draw them to yourself, I pray. For Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to sing one final song. And the musicians are back up on the stage. And that's that wonderful old song, The Old Rugged Cross. If you know the words, sing along with us. If you don't, Google the words, and I'm sure you'll be able to sing along with us. God bless you. <laughs>
concludes our service for this morning. I trust that it has been a good experience for you. We are missing you terribly. It's horrible not to see the pews filled with people, though I am glad that there were some people here this morning uh, rather than preaching to empty pews. And I trust that Easter will be a good Easter for you. May the Lord, as Billy Graham used to say, bless you all real good. Thank you.